Hi friends, host Eric here, host of Talking to Famous People, joining you from a very, very cold January Los Angeles evening, where it is currently a very brisk and chilly 40 degrees. Ouch. That's cold. So... In this episode of Exciting Tables and Words about human personality, I'm not in the garage, I got a little heater, and, you know, I'm be okay. Uh, we're going to cover relative absolutism and absolute relativism. This can broadly be called uh, TI and TE, okay, or additionally, empirics and, and reason. A little background music. Relative absolutism. Under this frame, words are absolute in their expression, but relative in their meaning. So whenever someone says something, those words have precise meanings in that context. They're unchanging meanings, just as the weight of a one-pound brick is unchanging. However, in another context, one might define the word differently, and thus offer that this time the brick is two pounds. Once agreed upon, that's what it is for the duration of that exchange. The reality of the brick is just a status that's absolutely within that frame. Reality, which itself is a brick to be defined for the purposes of making arguments about the relationship between bricks and reality. So, in other words, TI. Absolute relativism. AR. The meaning of something is absolute to the particular parties and is distinct from the definitional constraints of relative absolutism. Thus, people often say things like, well, I know I said it that way, but I mean something else. Or, you don't get what I mean, I'm just not expressing it well. This presumes that there is a meaning outside the pre precise definition of the word. RA says, if you mean anything at all, you present that meaning in static words so that others can glean the information you can base, scrutinize it, and determine statuses against other such words. AR says, no, words are how I attempt to express meaning that authentically exists beyond words. It doesn't matter how relatively absolute your conclusion is because it's not absolutely relative to me or other people. All right, so this is, this explains the fundamental dispute that I think underlies a lot of, a lot of conflict between people and discursive disagreements and difficulties with solving things. debate impacts and criteria the status quo the arguments we make here in competitive debate produce tomorrow's common argumentational usage there's a genuine trickle-down effect in the marketplace of ideas when ideas are genuinely good so it matters a lot how we debate in competition and it matters a lot how we debate we and others debate on the internet and in our public spaces Quality argumentation. The best arguments have multiple qualities. They're concise, they appeal to a universal and unquestioned truth, they analogize soundly, they're logically valid, they resonate with people's authentic attachments, they display concerns for the common welfare, and they legitimize against a concrete measurable effectiveness. Note that analogy is the realm primarily of NE, not necessarily of TI, so you can have sound analogies without TI. Be an ENFP, uh, but I'm not. I'm not entirely confident that those analogies are going to be as sound. I'd have to think about it more. Why am I talking about these things, debate stuff again? Well, it links so much to the other shit we're talking about, you know. And I hopefully I'll make the link explicit here at some point. Judging considerations. Competition debate, however, favors some of those virtues and countervalues others. They proper judging of a round, in fact, ignore some aspects of arguments entirely while affording others great significance. Logical validity is a necessary but insufficient burden, typically, while measurable effectiveness is often determinate in convincing the judge to vote for you. So, being defensible TI-wise um, can sometimes function like a prerequisite to being able to make impacts related arguments in certain rounds of debate. It, it plays like that. <clears throat> a lot of rounds, you know. Lay judges will often vote with their authentic attachments. 
So most debaters explicitly display concern for welfare, at least in lay cases. Lay judges and empirics. The more lay the judge, that means the less experienced the judge is, basically. The more necessary to rely on empirics because the absolute relativism of their judging metric implies the frame of empirics, particular substantiation, is preferred reflexively. Actual harms in the real world are weighed more heavily than are threats to principles or to the integrity of a system's grammar. So it is that with lay judges, appeals to conditionality-based decisions, that's not standing, which means this is unwarranted, so it falls too, are less likely to attain the correct result than are appeals to emotions likely to attain the wrong, res wrong result. The resonance of an argument with an individual operating under an absolutely relative frame is to the actual experience of individuals, not to its legitimacy against other static word objects in the ground. So if you want to be somebody who reflexively uses that frame of absolute relativism, then you need to learn how to shift frames to do debate. One of the good things about debate is it'll say, okay, well, I may be, I may have absolute relativism as my frame, but I need to learn to be relatively absolute when it's judging this frown. I need to take my own perspective and attachments out of it and treat it mechanically. The way forward. A way forward. The debate community has within it to affirm the good as defined through the implicit value of adversarial rhetoric, namely our best practices, quote-unquote, subjecting of claims to made to scrutiny and motivated attacks such that bad ideas don't get affirmed into actual policy. This is why AF has the burden. This is why we default to neg if AF fails to meet that burden. Metaphysical evolution. Human understanding grows cross-generation... cross Human understanding grows cross-generationally, and this evolution reflects in our argumentation. Identity politics comprise the authentic rejection of an unjust status quo in the absence of widespread incorporation of a better way to attack that injustice. We see those argumentation blocks break apart now as the implications of their inconsistencies make them lose ever more rounds over time. Wrong with facilitating apologism. The real source of the injustice always gets away scot-free when the good guys chase down the wrong suspect. In this instance, as in every instance, injustice manifests because the ends have been used to justify the means. If they weren't used for such, they wouldn't enter into the discussion at all. The positive obligation of debate. Thus, debate's future and duty is the annihilation of utilitarianism from serious conversation about public policy. We fulfill this duty along two lines of legitimization. Foremost, the ethical discussion always ends with the utilitarian side grasping to behave as a real normative framework. It can only give us the moral status of an act in hindsight. It might prescribe action according to a best estimate of outcome, but that's a second problem. Those kinds of predictions are absolutely relative. My prediction is legitimate only on my hopes and guesses, unless I appeal to empirics. And that's where the evil creeps in. Predicting that this or that change in law will save lives, quote-unquote, neglects to presume that vastly more vectors come into play than can be causally reduced in this fashion. It further avoids that those vectors produce outcomes measured in many different units important to different people in different ways. To measure only those impacts you want is to render empirics meaningless in drawing conclusions about a thing. Okay, so, all of all, to death to the PMT calculi. Impact calculus. The traditional impact calculus is that commonly employed in policy debate, probability, magnitude, and time frame. This calculus continues to be used in many rounds today. The appeal of it is that it affords the competitor a tighter frame in which to put together a case, and it gives the judge a common unit of measure upon which to decide the round. The primacy of this calculus in debate for a long time reflected in an implicit frame which suggests that looking ahead by extrapolations is a good way to make decisions about what action ought to be taken now. This still resonates as true for many people, because for individuals acting as individuals in pursuit of their own interests, it is true. <laughs> this is good stuff. It's a little debatey, perhaps, for maybe what you're expecting here, but it explains a lot about how personality manifests, these, these qualities of personality manifest in things like debate, you know? These... These... Disputes here are T-E-T-I and frame metaframe. Individual agency. Individual agency expresses best when the proactive aspects of the self adhere to the conclusions of an interested calculus, while the constraining aspects of the self adhere to the conclusions of a disinterested calculus. 
In other words, because I love my brother more, it's okay that I save him first before going back for the other kids trapped in the fire. But it's not okay to use another child to shield my brother from the fire knowing the other child will get burned. The decision to act in support of one interest is acceptable provided it violates none of the constraints that are affirmed by the disinterested calculus. Groups in the public sphere. In the public sphere, individuals carry out the will of the group, thus deferring their agential ownership somewhat. The group, however, does not have interests, and every proactive expression is the expression of one of the individuals governing the group. Cooperation between individuals in the governing group purportedly produces a hybrid policy that balances competing interests. However, no such policy should be affirmed unless it upholds against the constraints of disinterest first. Just as the risk of burn to one's brother doesn't justify the burning of another child, so too does the act of compromise between individuals pursuing their particular interests justify the abdication. So too, not not justify. I should say not justify here. That's kind of important. Hmm, it's this thing. I hate that. Okay, well I have to switch back to this mode. I don't want to switch it back, but I will. Okay, here we go. Editing. What page is this? Here we go back to the same page. Stay on the same page? Okay, good. Um, so, too, does the act of compromise between individuals with particular interests not justify... The abdication of each cooperating individual to adhere to the constraints of past disinterested muster. It's okay, it's not okay if the federal government sends aid to the president's hometown and not the more damaged and needy one because the president likes his hometown more. This continues to be true even if we point out all the good done in the president's hometown and measure all the ways in which the other town doesn't really need it, and regardless of any metrics we present at all. It's wrong because it applies interest where only disinterest is morally permitted. Policy making and legitimizing. Thus, it is that to which, it, thus it is that to wisely determine. Thus it is that to wisely determine public policy, we must negate the subjective and the interested in our consideration. Governance is foremost the custodial work of having a monopoly on use of force. That is a proposed application. That a proposed application of that force be just ought to be a necessary criterion for consideration, but insufficient for adoption. I read that poorly, but it's it's a good paragraph. I'll you know, read it again. Thus, it is that to wisely determine public policy, we must negate the subjective and the interested in our consideration. Government, governance is foremost the custodial work of having a monopoly on use of force. That a proposed application of that force be just ought to be a necessary criterion for consideration, but insufficient for adoption. I'll be ready to go in about five minutes here, Ruben. Empirically supported outcomes purportedly to be attained in the world of the affirmative after the advocacy becomes policy always manifest an interested subjective calculus. The process of utilizing such evidence begins at the conclusion sought to be sustained and works backward to find supporting data. Empirical substantiation is inherently a subjective advocacy because only objective analysis acknowledges the limits of prediction within a chaotic complex adaptive system. Empirical substantiation is the selling of a link story to justify something. If the action prescribed didn't need to justify some transgress transgressive elements, then it wouldn't need to rely on empirics to outweigh the harms it necessarily created in hopes of speculative benefits. The realities of affirmation. The affirmation of any advocacy also affirms the implicit frame of that advocacy. Thus, if we affirm that which justifies means by appealing to ends, we also affirm that manner of decision making. Each of us has a duty to constrain ourselves against universal limiting principles. Claim otherwise is to claim that sometimes it's okay to unjustly commit non-responsive violence against some people. Almost none of the debaters who advocate government force to further purportedly just ends. Almost none of the debaters who advocate government force to further purportedly just ends, while ignoring the justice itself as a process critique, would be comfortable actually doing the job of the legally empowered individual who sticks the gun in the non-transgressor's face and forces them into a cage. We all feel the injustice of our own behavior and be sickened by it, but we tend we all tend to ignore that. We don't have that experience, right? Um, so it's not that significant to us. 
takeaway. Until we as a community acknowledge that our reliance on empirics predictions and the balancing of interests necessarily produces a discursive environment in which such aggression manifests, we will continue to reinforce the bad reasoning that enables such transgressive governance to, per to persist. So this is sort of a, crit a debate critique paper that, I mean, I I'm I'm really impressed with this, actually. I uh, This whole thing, from here down, this is really good. I I remember sort of writing it, I guess. I sort of remember. I mean, obviously I wrote it, but I... Um, it was a while ago, but it's polished, too. The writing's really polished in it. It's, it's an excellent critique. I'm going to cut this for debate cards, for sure. I cut my own shit all the time, so... Because it's like I want... I just write analytics. It's the only way of cutting your own shit. You just call it an analytic. I will right, we'll go on to the next one the next time. Anyway, that's some debate stuff. It definitely links, and you can see how I'm making those arguments with TI, FITE, and stuff, although I don't exactly use the terminology in here. Um, okay, so I'm so tired. I gotta go take Ruben now to the thing. Here we go. It's time to leave. I got a big bit of excitement sitting on your face. A big bit of excitement. Don't forget to taste the excitement or else you'll be late and lament that you never tasted all that delicious juicy nougat like thing I was saying. What was the thing I was saying? Ferns, I don't know. Ferns. 